Welcome back to another episode of the DFS Army Kill Shot Podcast. I'm Kyle Marley. With me is host of Half the Battle, Dan Levy. We're here to break down this UFC Vegas 43 card from a DraftKings perspective. Uh, we got another 100K up top this week, free card. Not the best on paper, but there's some fights I'm looking forward to, and I'm always looking to play for that 100K. But how you doing today, Dan? Doing excellent, man. I mean, still riding hot on this uh, Braves World Series win. Uh, it's funny because... You know, people said that ATL fans were fair weather and that we didn't have the, the best fans in sports. And not only do we, do we have the second most attended, you know, year of any baseball team, but our World Series merch sold out within 30 minutes of it going on sale. So I somehow got my hands on some of it. So I'm still waiting on some of it to arrive. So I'm just stoked, man, just uh, enjoying it. And we got UFC this weekend, so I mean, there's some really good fights: Brady versus Kiesa, and uh, there's some other good ones on there. Adrian Yanez, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I am always excited for Adrian Yanez fight weeks, uh, and then that Brady Chiesa fight that might as well be the main event. I feel like that's the people's main event this week, anyways. Looking forward to that one. Uh, but let's start with the first fight of the night. We got Luana Pinero Pinero minus 435 against Sam Hughes. Plus three thirty, uh, looks looks like a, a one sided beating early in the fight. But if Sam Hughes can weather the storm, you think she can come back late and get the W? Yeah, I mean that's the big question, right? I mean I think the early going. Listen, let me just say this: if Pinero wins this fight, she will be on the optimal lineup. I mean we're talking about multiple takedowns, we're talking about knockdowns, we're talking about submissions, we're talking about finishes. So I think Pinero does come out here, get that judo throw, get that arm bar. But if she doesn't and you're sitting on a plus 330 ticket, I mean, that second and third round might look kind of nice because, I mean, at the end of the year on half the battle, we like to give our end of the year awards, whether we're talking about knockout of the year, submission of the year, fighter of the year. But you also like to give the Academy Award for actor of the year and the Oscar. I mean, the front runner this year is Aljamain Sterling, but I think a close second has to be Luana Pinheiro. So, but hey. I mean, that win bonus still counts for something on uh, DraftKings, right? So, uh, yeah, the pick is Pinero here. But I got to give Hughes a lot of credit. I mean, to fight Tisha Torres in your debut when you've had less than 10 pro fights, I mean, I, I don't know how to say. Like, if it was a guy, I'd be like, man, he's got balls. I don't know what to say about her. But she's got whatever that expression is for ladies. Uh, she's got that going for her. Yeah, I, I'm definitely on the Panero side here. I just think she's the much better fighter. Uh, the gas tank is really the only worry. And the fact that she looked for the way out in that last fight when she was winning the fight made me think that maybe she didn't even trust her own gas tank uh, because I didn't really understand what, what that was all about. It didn't look like she was concussed to me. Like her brain looked like it was working fine enough. Um, but who am I to tell? But I do think she does dominate this fight early. And I, I'm going to pick her to get an early finish, whether that's a, a TKO stoppage on the ground or a submission on the ground. And I do think that's got a good chance to be on the optimal lineup because she's got multiple takedowns. Like you said, she had five takedowns against Marcos in that first round before it got the, the fight got called off. And Sam Hughes is probably going to be easier to take down than Marcos. So I would not be shocked to see just another mauling on the ground here. Uh, the only issue is that she's the most expensive fighter on the card. I do like a lot of the expensive fighters on this card, but she probably is my favorite if I can't afford to pay up for her. I like her in all formats, but I do trust other fighters, you know, throughout the course of 15 minutes on this card a little bit more. So maybe I would lean to them in cash games, but Panero might be my highest owned favorite on this card. And then on the Sam Hughes side, I'm really just not interested in Sam Hughes. Even if she does weather the storm, come back, win, you know, late second round or the third round, I don't know that she's going to score enough points for it to matter, for it to be on the 100K lineup. So probably going to be Xing her out of my player pool this week. All right, next one on the card, we got Sean Soriano, minus 275 against Shailen Norden Becky, plus 220. Uh Soriano 0 and 4 in the UFC. Just seeing a minus 275 against anybody is kind of a worry with this guy, but it is a good matchup for him. He does have a good striking edge here, but break this fight down for me. Yeah, I mean, look, Sean Soriano is like the Latino Michael Johnson. I mean, 
he's a badass fighter. It's just for some reason he tends to whoop your ass and then just fuck up around the seven minute mark. And one thing I got to say about Shai Lan is that he attempted 14 takedowns in his UFC debut. So at least you know that if you're taking the shot on this guy, win, lose, or draw, he is going to try to do the right game plan. But that being said, man, Sean Soriano is just on a completely different level than him. And, I mean, this is basically like, Sean, come get your first UFC win, kid. I mean, like, you've shown all the glimpses. We know you're a good fighter. You just beat dudes' asses and then get choked out, right? So I'm not saying that can't happen here, but, like, Sean, like, let's get that first UFC win. So I'm going to go Sean Soriano to finally, fourth time is the charm, Kyle Marley. No, uh, fifth time is the charm, Kyle Marley, to get that UFC uh, first win. Yeah, um, I'm actually going to go on the other side, but it's really just the line that talked me into it. I can't agree with a three-to-one line on Soriano against anybody, and I do think uh, this Norton Becky has a path to victory, and that being through the ground, I think he could maybe win two rounds just hanging out in top control, but the submission is what I think he has the best chance of getting a, a win here. But he probably does get his ass kicked in that first round, um, and Soriano has a good chance to put him away. So Soriano is a decent DraftKings play for that reason. Um, I think he's live for the first round knockout, 100 plus points. Maybe he's a guy that could kick Panero and higher ownership off the optimal lineup. But I'm going to take more shots on the underdog here um, and hope that he can be the guy that weathers a storm and comes back, gets a submission late in this fight. But definitely not confidence at all. It's just more so the line that talked me into that pick. Um, and then on the Soriano side, I like so many of the top favorites that I don't know that I'll be able to get to too much Soriano. But I could definitely see that burning me, so I'll probably put a couple hedge lineups in just in case he does get that first round knockout and my night's not over, you know, off the second fight of the night. All right, the third fight on the card, we got Cody Durden, minus 160 against, uh, all right, this is a tough one, uh, Orichi, yeah, Orichi Ring, plus 140. Did I get that right? Just say Orichi Mongolian Ring. murderer. I say what? The Mongolian murderer. That's Mongolian his name. Mongolian murderer. Okay, okay. I'm going to call him Aori, actually. But uh, break this fight down for me, bro. Yeah, I mean, listen, the Mongolian murderer, his deal is that he's one of these guys that is just so damn tough that you hit him with your hardest shot, and he is going to keep walking forward the entire time. So it's basically like, I know it says Mongolian murderer, but the flag says China. So let's just call him the Chinese zombie. Basically, like, you know, like, when – there's like a cockroach and like you step on it as hard as you can. And then it's still alive. Like you got to step on this cockroach a hundred times to get him out of there. So basically this fight comes down to mentality for Cody Duren because Cody Duren is better than this guy. It's just about Cody Duren when he hits this guy with his hardest shot and the guy's still walking forward, Cody can't get discouraged when Cody takes this guy down and gets him, gets, you know, gets his back and attempts submissions and the guy gets out of them. Cody can't be discouraged. So Cody's just got to be focused for 15 straight minutes, and he's going to come out here and win at least two of these rounds, if not get a finish. So give me Cody Durden for the dub. But it, to me, this fight's not about skill, because I know Cody's better than this guy. To me, this is about mentality. Like, do not get discouraged if this guy eats your hardest shot and keeps walking forward, because Cody's used to putting these guys away early on his regional scene. So he's just got to be ready to whoop this guy's ass for 15 straight minutes. I'm going to be on the other side of this one as well. I think Aori can win this fight in the striking. I think he could get a knockout in any round, but I I think Cody's best path to victory would be to wrestle here. Uh, look to wrestle and grapple. I think he would probably be a little bit too much for Aori on the ground. Uh, I just don't know that he can consistently wrestle for 15 minutes and win two of the rounds. That is his best path to victory, in my opinion, is just grinding out the fight, getting two rounds, if not all three on the scorecards, if he is able to mix in takedowns. But I just think Aori is going to be the one pushing forward on the feet, landing the harder shots, having higher volume. He might make some takedowns in himself. Um, I'm just not sold enough on Durden to pay $8,600 on DraftKings, and I'm more so looking to do a, a stars and scrubs approach this week. I'll probably pay up above Durden and then go down and get some of these underdogs like Aori. Um, and then uh, the guy we just talked about, Norton, Becky, some guys like that where I can fit in the heavy favorites on this card, like Panero. Um, so for this one, it's going to be more so dog or pass, and I am going to pick uh, Aori to win, actually, 
at least two, if not all three rounds on that side. So I like the underdog in this one, but I don't know if I can X Durden out of my pool. If I'm making 150 lineups, that's more so for my hand builds. I probably won't make more than, you know, 10 hand built lineups this week. And I just don't think Durden makes any of those with 150. I'm cool sprinkling them in a little bit, but I'm still more interested in the underdog on that one. Next one, we got a, a good striking match, I think. Uh, the line has been pretty even all week with a little shift back and forth. We got it pretty pick them right now with Ferez Zim minus 115 against Terrence McKinney minus 105. Uh, McKinney is a, a killer early in the fight. He has a lot of first-round finishes. Almost all of his finishes are within the first six minutes of a fight and usually in the first minute of a fight. So he is live for that 60-second slate-breaking bonus here. And I think that puts him in play on literally every card that he's on because that's one of his best paths to victory is just getting that early finish where he, he puts the guy away with one big shot and that breaks slates if it's within 60 seconds. So he's always going to be a good play. But what do you think about this matchup here against ZM? Yeah, he's not going to put away ZM in seven seconds or under a minute. I'll tell you that right now, man. I mean, look, ZM's a kid that won the K1 uh, striking championship when he was 18 years old. And he's still only 24. And I feel like we haven't seen the best from him yet. If you watch his regional scene, man. He was going out there. Firstly, his striking is very clean. He was going out there starching dudes. And I think that right now he's just going through a little bit of growing pains. You know, it's had some very tough matchups. You know, Don Madge undefeated in the UFC. Jamie Malarkey just knocked out Devontae Smith. So, uh, and Luigi Vandermini might be one and three in the UFC, but every single guy that fought Luigi Vandermini had to go through some adversity. I mean, Zaleski got his back taken from Luigi Vandermini. The kid that uh, Darren Till knocked down seven times but couldn't knock out got knocked out by uh luigi vandermini Ferreziam got full mounted by uh, by vandermini and most recently that kid landed a bomb on patty pimblet so even though luigi's one and three everybody goes through adversity when they fight luigi and let me say something about Ferreziam. once this kid starts to feel comfortable inside the octagon i'm telling you right now kyle marley you are going to see some highlight reel knockouts from this guy just give him a little bit of time to develop and if terrence mckinney thinks he can just come out here and just get a quick you know seven second knockout just because he knocked out a guy in frivola who literally gets dropped every single ufc fight he's in like that's just not going to be the case here man so mckinney's best bet is to wrestle he does have a wrestling background and Ferez has been taken down before but Ferez is also stuffed 20 takedowns inside the ufc so let's not sit here and act like his takedown defense is some kind of joke because it absolutely isn't so i think he's got to be careful in the early going but sec come but come second and third round Ferez Yam is taking over this fight not sure if he's if we're gonna finally get that knockout i've been waiting for but i'm picking ziam to win this fight yeah well said and i am on the ziam side as well uh, this guy's got some really good defense on the feet. Definitely nothing like Frivola. And then he's going to uh -huh. be a problem uh, offensively as well. I think it is going to be an early storm. He's got to weather some big shots, stuff some takedowns here. But if he gets, makes it out of the first round, I think he does take over and gets a second or a third round knockout himself. Maybe he even gets that knockout in the first round. We saw Sean Woodson knock out Terrence McKinney on the contender series. I think Zim could do the same thing with the same style. Um, it's just that with Zim. He's not high volume. He's really not looking to get the fight to the ground. So we kind of are always relying on a knockout with him for him to score well on DraftKings. So that's my worry here. I'm definitely going to take some shots here because I think he'll go overlooked and McKinney might be a little bit overowned. Uh, but I, I'm, I can never X McKinney out of any lineup at this point. I mean, he's just an early finisher and we love those on DraftKings. So he'll be in some of my lineups, but I would rather go and get some leverage on the ZM side here. I'll take him to get a knockout as well but i'm looking forward to that fight that's going to be a fun one for as long as it lasts and that might not be very long all right next one on the card we got loopy godinez minus 160 against loma look plus 140 talk to me about this one listen i mean i got so much respect for uh loopy godinez just the fact that you know, she's willing to take these fights back to back to back she doesn't care who her opponent is i mean you you uh 
ring her you ring her phone she's gonna answer and she's gonna take the fight no questions asked so as a human being that is such an admirable quality but in terms of wins and losses that's a terrible quality kyle marley because she's taking fights that you'd think that someone coming into the ufc that's undefeated like here's jessica panay here's the corpse of jessica panay goes out there loses that fight might be controversial but i mean like, like, why is it even close versus Jessica Panay when all these other girls were mauling her? Um, then, you know, she took care of that soccer mom. Congrats. Great job. And then the Luana Carolina fight, like, why are we, why are people acting like that fight's uh, controversial also, man? And now turning around again on short notice to fight one of the best strikers in the division. I mean, look, Godinez has to take her down. She has to sub her to win this fight or just... Uh, land repeated takedowns over and over again otherwise she's not only going to get pieced up badly at range in the clinch she's going to be eating disgusting elbows and if Lu and if loma's takedown defense has improved just this much which it seems to be doing every single fight this is going to be a rough night for lupi goldinia so give me loma to come out here and get this upset Uh, I'm going to be on the other side. I just, and more so for the ceiling. I think Loopy's best path to victory is, as you mentioned, take her down and submit her. If not, you know, grind out two rounds on the scorecards, rack up multiple takedowns here. Uh, but that's what has the ceiling on DraftKings. If she is able to get that done, I think she can score well. Um, so I like her in all formats because I think she has a floor as well because I don't see Lukbunmi getting a knockout here. I don't see Lukbunmi getting a takedowns or, or a submission. So she has a decent floor unless she just completely gasses out and does get finished later, something like that. I just don't see that happening. So I'm almost all on the Godinez side, and I don't really have any interest in Lukbunmi. I think if Loma does win this fight, she could score around 10x. I just don't think she has 100-plus upside like some of these under, other underdogs on the card do. So it's going to be Godinez's pass or pass for me. But I think you brought up some good points. I could definitely see her failing on some later takedowns here. And then, look, Boonmi just picking her apart on the feet and getting it done. It's just that the, the score I don't see being there. So I'll, I'll mix in some Godinez. But I like everybody from Godinez up, really. So it's going to be who can I afford? And I'm not going to make her a priority when I'm fine paying up for some other ones right in that same salary. Uh, but I will take her to get the win here, whether it's submission or uh, a decision grinding out two rounds. Next one on the card, we got Hoffa Garcia minus 125 versus uh, Nathan Levy plus 105. Talk to me about this fight. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, everyone thinks I'm going to just pick Levy because his last name is Levy. But firstly, we spell our names differently. So, uh, you know, my boy's got to do something about that. Um, but I'll say this. For an Israeli fighter, he might be the one hope because Noad Lahat was fucking terrible. The two guys on Contender Series were trash. But this kid actually seems like he's talented and he's got some skills, man. I mean, he's got a good submission ability. His kicks are on point. He's got the he's got the physique. I know he's in shape. He trains out of a great camp at Syndicate. Um, my only concern with Levy is he's only six and no, he's just a baby in this game. Kyle Marley, he's green. He needs experience. But at the same time, only being six and no, having less than 10 pro fights, you're going to see these big leaps every single time uh, we see him out there. And with Rafa Garcia, I mean, what can I say? He's a Mexican warrior. He's not going to take a knee for nobody. I mean, this guy's going to come out here. He's going to be throwing bombs. He's going to be there for all 15 minutes. He's got twice the experience of Levy. He ran into some tough competition to, to start things off. I mean, hack Paras for his debut. And I think what happened in the Gritzmacher fight is that, you know, Gritzmacher is that guy that, He's so easy to hit that guys get carried away. Props to Alex Hernandez for knocking him out because normally on, on normal terms, Gritzmacher's got an iron jaw. So props to Alex Hernandez on that. But I think what happened was that Rafa Garcia rocked him and just kind of blew his load thinking he was going to – he was going to get him out of there. I mean, you remember when Joe Lozon fought Grits and Joe Lozon was teeing off and all of a sudden Grits is still there coming forward. That's what happens when you fight a guy like Chris Gritzmacher. So in this fight, I mean, look, I think Levy's got the higher ceiling. I think Levy's going to go farther. It's just about, is he ready right now? He's only six and no, he's just a, he's just a kid in this game. So, I mean, I, I got to go with Levy. I, you know, I ain't about to pick against Levy on this show. It's just, uh, you know, I hope Natan is ready right now. I know he's going to be ready in the future. I just hope he's ready right now. But I think Rafa is going to give him a tough fight for sure. 
Yeah, I just think the level of experience from Garcia is what trumps everything for me because they, they look somewhat similar. And Garcia, in my opinion, just looks slightly better everywhere. But it wouldn't shock me to see him get guillotined or, or gas out and get finished later, just uh, being a little too slow and Levy picking him apart for the last two rounds, something like that. But I'm more so on the Garcia side. And he is the slight under or slight favorite now, minus 125. We're getting him as an underdog on DraftKings at 7,700. So I think he's a solid cash game play for that reason. I think he'll probably go um, somewhat over-owned in GPP. So I'm not against going away from him for that reason. But he is going to be one of my favorite underdogs on this card to pick. I, I love that value. Uh, I think he can have success with takedowns here and maybe even get a submission of his own. I, I just haven't seen enough from Levy to make me – feel confident enough to make this almost a 50 50 fight where I do slightly favor Garcia. So um, give me the, the, the underdog on DraftKings, but that's not value. I'm usually looking to pass up either, especially in, in the cash games where you don't need to, to come in first place to win the big prize. Uh, Levy will mostly be a fade for me just because he's 8,500 and he's an underdog on the betting line. I'd rather just take my shots 8,800 and up. So Similar to Durden, they're both like plus 300 inside the distance. I just don't know that they're going to get it done. Even if they do win, I don't think that they score enough. So I'm going to be looking to pay up higher than those guys. Next one on the card, we got Pat Sabatini, minus 125 against Tucker Lutz, plus 105. This could be a fun grappling match. How do you see it going down? Dude, this is the toughest fight to call. Uh, on the entire card for me. I mean, I think both these guys are super talented. I think they both got bright futures. I think they both got high fight IQ. I think they're both well-rounded. I mean, this is just, I don't know. I, I can't say it's my favorite fight on the card because I mean, we got, you know, Davey Grant and a Adrian Yanez uh, on there. But I mean, this is, is this is just, I think it's going to be a chess match, man. I mean, I really, really do. And it's easy to sit here and say, all Tucker Lutz has to do is stuff the takedowns, and then he's got the volume edge. But I don't think it's that simple, Kyle, man. I mean, I think that Pat Sabatini is super crafty with his stand-up. I know the numbers say he only lands, you know, one point, whatever. But he's the kind of guy that he runs away, so therefore it makes it kind of hard for his opponent to get off on volume. He's kind of opportunistic when he lands his shots. His ground game is on another level. I mean, you saw that submission he hit on Jamal Emmer's don't sleep on Sabatini. Also landed a knockdown in his debut. And then Tucker Lutz, he is a guy that he's a junkyard dog. He's rugged. As the fights carry on, the volume starts to pick up. Takedown offense, takedown defense. I mean, I'm very impressed with both these guys. So I don't really know. So just give me the underdog Tucker Lutz by a decision. Yeah, I kind of think the line should be flipped on this one. I do think Sabatini's the better grappler, the more dangerous guy on the ground, but I think Lutz is the better wrestler, the better striker, the guy that'll be pushing forward, landing the higher volume. Uh, so I'm, I'm taking Lutz to win a decision here. I think he can win two, if not three rounds. He's just got to avoid the submission, and that's the worry. That has a low floor where I'm a little bit worried in cash games. I still like him to win. I think there's value there, so I'm cool with him in cash games, but he does have a low floor where these other guys could go three rounds lose and still score 30 or 40 points where if Lutz loses in the first round, that's going to kill your, your cash game lineup. So I like him more so in GPPs, but at the same time, I don't know that he's going to go out there and be looking for takedowns that we would need for him to score high because the ground is where you got to worry about Sabatini. And if this is a striking match, I think Lutz will be ahead on the volume, but I don't know that that is going to score enough to be on the optimal lineup. So it is going to be mostly Lutz or pass for me. But I do think he'll be somewhat popular, and I'm not against going away from higher ownership underdogs because there are a few I'm picking on this card, and some that I'm not picking have really high ceilings. So there's a lot of spots to go, but I do think Lutz will end up being one of my favorites on the underdog side. Sabatini is just that I like the 8.8K in up range, so I don't think he'll make too many of my lineups. If I end up really overweight on Lutz, then I'll probably have a hedge lineup or two with Sabatini, but not really a guy that I'll, I'll be prioritizing at all on this card next one on the card we got adrian yanez minus 310 versus davy grant plus 245 i'm a big yanez fan i think he can go really far in this sport some of the most exciting stand-up um in the division you know in, in the ufc really uh and i'm i think this is a a good test for him because he does have to fight off 
some takedowns here from Grant, and he's going to have to do that a lot in the future as well because not a lot of people are going to want to strike with this guy. How do you see this fight going down? I mean, dude, this kid, Giannis, how legit is he, man? I mean, you know, it, it's funny because at first I kind of questioned the legitimacy. I, I, You know, and that was before – I really sat down and watched his entire career, which before that last fight with Costa, I literally sat down and watched Yanez's entire pro career from, from his debut to his last fight. And man, I'm blown away because it's one of these things where it's like, we know his hands are great, but there's all the questions about, well, what about, what about his heart? What about his ground game? And I'm here to tell you, Kyle Marley, the kid's got balls. The kid's got heart. His second pro fight. He fought this kid named Levi Miles, who will be in the UFC one day, by the way. Also has a win over Jimmy Flick. But Levi Miles smashed Adrian Yanez. And Adrian Yanez didn't quit. He didn't look for a way out. He took his ass whooping like a man. And this was only his second pro fight. So now fast forward and let's see, what, what's his record now? Um, Adrian Yanez is currently 14-3. and three. So now, now we're 17 fights deep into his career and i already know the kids got heart i already know the kids got hands well how's his ground game the kid's a black belt in jujitsu the kid can stuff takedowns he is the complete package kyle marley and you look at the losses he's had and on paper oh my god he lost to domingo Pilarte. you actually watch that fight and the ref had to warn domingo Pilarte for running away the miles john fight the ref had to warn Miles Johns for stalling. So basically, the way to beat this guy is to fight him like a you know what. And you know how you know Dave, you know what's one thing about Davy Grant? Davy Grant fights like a man. Davy Grant ain't no bitch. Davy Grant is gonna come out here and try to take your head off from the minute the bell rings to the minute someone's unconscious. The issue is that Adrian Yanez has the much tighter hands here. So Adrian Yanez is going to capitalize. Adrianas is going to be the first man in MMA history to knock out Davy Grant. Hopefully they can get a fight of the night along the way, but I'm thinking it's going to be a performance of the night for Adrian Giannis. He will be on the optimal lineup, Kyle Marley. Yeah, I, I'm definitely going to be picking Giannis here, and I'm going to pick him by, by knockout. Grant's striking looks very much improved, but it's just not improved enough to beat Giannis. So he's going to have to look to grapple here. I don't think he can submit Giannis. Maybe he can. I don't know. But I just have a hard time seeing him win two rounds on the scorecards as well. Uh, so give me Giannis. My worry would be that Grant wins the first round and Giannis doesn't really start scoring until round two. Um, I feel like he needs the, the knockout in the second round if that's the case for him to end up on the optimal lineup. And if this fight goes to a decision or a round three finish, I just don't know that Yanez will have enough to score more than Panero and some of these other favorites on the card. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely have a good amount of Yanez, but he's not a lock or anything for me. I think he's a solid play in all formats. I like him enough that I, I will X Grant out of my player pool, even though I think if Grant wins, he's going to score well. I, I'm just going to take my chances. I'd rather take shots on other underdogs here. So. I will be Xing Grant out of the Domination Station, which is the optimizer for DFS Army. If you haven't signed up for DFS Army yet, you should give us a try. Uh, you can save 10% every month with promo code Sleeveless. We have tools and coaches for all sports. NBA, NFL are going right now. We have coaches notes for, for MMA. We have the optimizer for MMA. So I think you guys will like it if you give us a try. Uh, DFSArmy.com, promo code Sleeveless. All right, next fight on the card, we got Tyler Santos, minus 380 against Joanne Wood, formerly known as Calder Wood, uh, plus 290. How do you see this fight going down, Dan? I mean, listen, um, if you give me the – firstly, why isn't this fight on – US... oh, never mind. Here it is. I found it. Okay. If you gave me the Tyler Santos that – Cost me a minus 150 tick, minus 150 against Barella. Because I'll bet that a hundred more times you give me Tyler Santos minus 150 against Barella. You give me that timid whatever that was performance, then yeah, Joanne's going to win. But that clearly wasn't who she truly is. Maybe Octagon Jitters on that debut. I don't know. I, I still don't have an explanation. I mean, it's kind of like Michelle Pereira losing to Tristan Connolly. Like sometimes this sport just doesn't make sense. It is what it is. It's, it's like Charlie Brenneman beating Rick Story. Like sometimes shit just doesn't make sense. But 
here, I mean, look, Joanne Calderwood, she's a veteran. She fights close with a lot of people. She's she's tough. I mean, she's been in there with everybody, so I respect her. The volume's on point, obviously. But if they're just in different spots of their career, man. The momentum's on Tyla Santos' side. She's more physical. I think she's going to bully Joanne Calderwood and just move on up the ladder. So give me Tyler Santos here. Yeah, I agree. I'm a, I've been a big Jojo backer because I love her volume on the feet. And I think that's her path to win in this fight as well. Just keep it a striking match and level up on the strikes over Santos. And maybe she can get two rounds on the scorecards, but the judges don't even like when she out volumes people. So that's definitely a worry. And I think Santos is the more dangerous striker of the two. She'll be landing the harder blows. And the wrestling from Santos is what I think really gives her what she's a minus 380 here is just because she can rack up three to five to eight takedowns in this fight and spend eight to 12 minutes in top control. She can really win in a variety of ways here. I just think she's the better all around fighter. Um, I, yeah, I'd love to see her run that back with Barella. That that line wouldn't be close to minus 150 anymore. And it still blows my mind how, how that fight happened. But I don't think we see that Santos again. I think this is a, a decent fight to see how good she is, and I think she passes it. And with her wrestling, I think she has a path to a high score. She scored 114 DraftKings points in her fight against Roxy. Um, I don't think she would score quite that much here, but she could put up enough to outscore everybody on the card, which wouldn't wouldn't shock me. So give me Santos, and I'll probably end up fading Wood here uh, just because I don't see her getting it done any other way than volume, and that might not be enough to put her on the optimal because I don't know that she's going to have that same kind of volume against somebody like Santos who can throw back some, some shots that, that hurts you. All right. Next fight on the card. We got, um, where are we at? Kung Ho King minus minus one fifteen against honey. Yaya minus one Oh five. Talk to me about this fight. This is a fight that we had already had take. It was supposed to take place like a month or so ago. Yaya got COVID and now they're just rematching, uh, the same same matchup they had back then, but talk to me about it. I mean, listen, Ronnie Yaya, one of the best jujitsu practitioners in all the UFC. I mean, if you it basically, if you uh, <laughs> if you're dripping blood and you jump into the ocean with the sharks, I mean, you're fucked. You know what I mean? It's just that once you hit that seven minute mark, you come in here with the right game plan, with the blueprint that's been established for years on how to beat Ronnie Yaya. I mean, the guy goes so hard for his takedown attempts, for his jujitsu attacks that he tends to fatigue. And one thing about Kyung Ho Kang is, I mean, the dude can scramble for days, and this ain't something new. He's been scrambling for years. I mean, look at his fight with Michinori Tanaka back in 2014. I mean, this guy's been there. This guy's done that. He's the more well-rounded fighter. As long as he doesn't slip up in the early going, he's going to take over late. He's going to win this fight. So give me Mr. Perfect Kyung Ho Kang. Yeah, I was originally picking Yaya the first time they were matched up, but it was more so that I kind of thought this was a 50-50 fight. He was the underdog, so I took Yaya by submission, even though I said in my breakdown that I think it's submission or bust. Uh, now that he's basically the favorite or, or pick him line, I'll take King, the guy who has more ways to win this fight. I don't see him submitting Yaya, uh, but he could land some takedowns, and I do think he's the better striker, and he could – easily win all three rounds on the feet here. He's somewhat of a gasser himself, but he, he's been able to out grapple everyone. That's going to wear you out a lot more than striking. And his best path to victory here is just to strike. You don't worry about out grappling. Yeah. Yeah. Don't try and wrestle with this guy. That's what you want to avoid is the ground game. If you can get out of the first round, then you're probably sitting pretty. Um, but yeah, yeah. best chance to win is a first round submission and that's 90 plus points. So he is an underdog. I like on this card. And the way I see the fight going on the Kang side, if he wins, I just don't see many takedowns being there. I don't know that he knocks Yaya out. I just don't think that he would score very well. So I probably won't get to too much Kang here. And even though I'm picking him, Yaya is my preferred DraftKings play just because he's got the ceiling for an underdog. If he goes out there, gets a first-round submission, 90-plus points, it's a good chance he's on the optimal lineup. Um, however, since I'm picking Kang, I'm not going to be loading up on Yaya. I will get more of the underdogs that I'm picking to win. Uh, it's just that Yaya will be more mixed in my lineups than Kang will in this fight. But, yeah, give me Kang to get a unanimous unanimous decision there and kind of make it look easy the longer this fight goes along. 
All right, next one, we got the people's main event. Sean Brady, minus 150 against Michael Chiesa, plus 130. Talk to me about this one, Dan. Look, offensively speaking, grappling-wise, Chiesa is good, man. He's strong as hell. He's long. He takes your back. I mean, he can choke guys out. He can ride that top position. The issue with Chiesa is he's a fantastic hammer, but he's a horrendous nail, man. This guy cannot overcome adversity. This guy breaks in fights. And he's only got a plan A. There's no plan B. There's no plan C. I mean, he can grind on guys for three straight rounds and make them take plan B. But as far as his strategy in the fight, there is no plan B for Michael Chiesa. It's either hold you down and submit you or quit. And one thing about Sean Brady is not only does he have a hundred percent takedown defense, Kyle Marley. Now, yeah, I know, I know he fought this, he fought this guy, he fought that guy. He's never truly been tested. He'll be tested here. This is his first top 15 guy, but this is one of the most winnable fights in the top 15 for him, stylistically speaking, because Kiesa has only got one thing he wants to do. He just wants to grapple. Well, Sean Brady is a black belt under, I think, Daniel Gracie. So if you want to come grapple, let's grapple. And then let's say that Sean Brady stuffs a couple takedowns. Um, The difference in the hands is big. The difference in the volume is big. The difference in the all in the all around stand up technique is big. But let's take it a step further, Kyle Marley. What about Sean Brady coming out here and landing some takedowns of his own? So what I think is going to happen is that Firstly, let me just preface this by saying I disagree with Michael Chiesa being ranked number six in the world. I think that that is a complete joke. How, like someone explained to me how he's number six in the world because he beat Neil Magny. That gets you to number six. There's plenty of guys that should be ranked ahead of Michael Chiesa. So Sean Brady is about to beat this guy that has no business being ranked number six. And now Sean Brady is going to be in the top 10. So Sean Brady's manager, you are a fucking genius, man. You got this guy into the top 15 with zero top 15 wins, and now you're going to get him into the top 10 by beating Michael Chiesa. So, my man, I want to learn from you. I want you to be my mentor. Give me Sean Brady via submission. Yeah, well said. I don't really have too much to add other than Chiesa's like Yaya on this card. If he wins, he's got a really good chance of being on that optimal lineup because it's probably going to be takedowns and then a submission. Um but if he's not getting takedowns on a submission, he's got nothing else to offer. Uh, his game plan is the same in every single fight. He's not going to go out there and win a striking match really against anybody. So Brady knows exactly what's coming at him. And if he can stuff the takedowns, then Chess is in trouble. I think Brady can get his own takedowns and Chess would be in a, a world of pain on the ground. I think Brady could just out volume on the feet, get a clear decision, maybe even knock him out, be the first to knock out Chiesa. Uh, who knows, but I do think he ends up getting a submission as well. As you mentioned, the hammer and nail, that's just perfect for Chiesa. He's a great hammer, awful nail, and I, I just see him being another awful nail in this one because I don't know that he can get takedowns here against a guy like Sean Brady. Um, so I expect Chiesa to be pretty owned on this card, and I mean somewhat rightfully so just because if he wins, he's scoring 90-plus points, and he's super cheap. Good chance of being on the optimal lineup. He opens up so much else in the top range for you. Um, I, I'm not against it at all. I wouldn't talk you off of Chiesa, but I'm probably going to go underweight to the Chiesa side, overweight to Brady, uh, and, and hopefully that submission comes early. Chiesa never gets a chance to get on top. Uh, and, and I agree with everything else that you said. Let's see uh, Brady get into the rankings and see what else he could do against some some more well-rounded fighters than Michael Chiesa. All right, next one we got. The actual main event of the card, uh, Ketlin Vieira, minus 115, slight favorite against Misha Tate, minus 105. On DraftKings, Misha Tate is the slight favorite, 8,300 against Vieira's uh, 7,900. But break this fight down for me, Dan. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because this time last year, Misha Tate was retired. And this time last year, Ketlin Vieira was coming off a serious surgery. So the fact that they're both in a main event, props to them. Um I mean, it's tough to call because it's like I'm not ready to say Misha Tate is back just because she beat a 44-year-old on their retirement fight. And, guys, when I say a 44-year-old, I know I like to be sarcastic. I know I like to exaggerate. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being sarcastic. Marion Renault was 44 years old in that fight where she fought Misha Tate, and she looked like she was more – 
motivated to give her a retirement speech than she was to actually fight that night. So I'm not ready to say Misha Tate's back. And then on the other side of things, Ketlin Vieira was once such a promising contender in the division, but she just hasn't been the same since she had that major surgery. She had, she had the same surgery that Dominic Cruz had, you know, um, I think it was like that knee surgery, but then like the cadaver got rejected. So she had to go back in and just everything went wrong and she hasn't looked the same since, but Skill for skill, I think Ketlin Vieira is better than her, man. I mean, her judo game is on point. Her jiu-jitsu game is on point. She comes from that Nova Onyal um, team. 92% takedown defense, I believe it is, off the top of my head. So, I mean, it's one of these things where Ketlin tends to dominate these fights and then does stupid shit in, like, the third round. Like the Kat Zingano fight. I had a max bet on Ketlin. Dominating the entire fight. Third round comes around, and she starts looking off into the crowd. The Yana Kuniskaya fight has her back for like four minutes and 30 seconds, then gives up the position, starts getting smashed on. Um, the Kelly Fasholds fights dominates the entire fight and then just stops fighting. I don't. I, so it's like I think the minutes are going to be won by Ketlin. Uh, it's just what I fear, Kyle, is that comeback finish from Misha Tate. Misha has a knack for getting her ass whooped and then submitting you out of nowhere in those late rounds. So that's what I'm worried about. But at the same time, what if Ketlin wins these first two rounds, pulls her usual stunt in the third, and then maybe gets a second win in the fourth and fifth, right? So we don't know what Ketlin looks like in championship rounds. So this is a tough fight for me to call. I do think you should take a little bit of Misha Tate just in case she gets that late comeback finish. But my pure pick is going to be Ketlin Vieira because I simply think she's the better fighter. But the better fighter doesn't always win. Yeah, very true, very true. Uh, and, and I agree with basically everything you said there. I would give Tate the advantage in experience, grappling, and cardio. Uh, but I think Vieira is the better striker, the more dangerous striker. She'll be the higher volume striker, the one pushing forward, kind of bullying Tate on the feet. And I think whoever's on the bottom is going to be losing on the ground. Whoever's the first to get the takedowns, I just see them being able to hang out in top control long enough where they're winning periods of that round and scoring well, hopefully, with some strikes or something. Uh, with some ground strikes, they don't even have to be hard anymore. Just a little pitter patter strikes on the ground that they, they can start adding up. Um, that could be either one of them, but I just favor it to be Ketlin Vieira early in the fight. And then the championship rounds are where I'm more worried. If this was a three round fight, I'm favoring Vieira at least 60%. I'm putting her at minus 150 or better. Um, but in five rounds, it's a worry, man. I don't know what she's going to look like in those fourth and fifth rounds when she's starting to slow down in three. Uh, and I don't know that she's had, you know, enough time to prepare for a real five round fight against an experienced vet like Tate. So I'm worried about those championship rounds. I think maybe Tate wins three, four and five or Vieira wins one, two and three. So I'm going to take the Vieira side. I think she could finish this fight, whether that be a TKO on the feet or maybe a submission as well. Um, and I think she has the higher ceiling for that reason, because she'll be best when when she's fresh early in the fight. Whereas if Tate gets the win, I don't know that she really starts scoring until later in the fight. And maybe she doesn't have a hundred plus upside. If that's the case, she probably has to come out, be the better wrestler grappler early in the fight for her to really put up a hundred plus points here. But we don't need a hundred from these ladies because they're right there priced in the mid range. We do have 25 minutes to work with. So I'm cool with both sides of this fight. Whoever you're picking to win, go overweight to them, maybe underweight to the other. I'm definitely going to have a, a fair share of lineups without this fight at all hoping that it is kind of how i see it going Vieira wins the first half of the fight tate wins the second half of the fight and a decision win from whoever it is doesn't quite put them on the optimal lineup i'll take some shots at that as well but give me Vieira to get the job done i think she can win the first three rounds and really just cruise the last four fourth and fifth and not get finished and get it done that way all right to end the podcast, we always do our kill shot, which is somebody who we think can be on the optimal lineup, who maybe some people are overlooking this week. You have anybody in mind for this card, Dan? Yes, and it's either going to be hit or miss, and that's Farez Ziam. If it's this low-scoring decision, then I apologize, but I've been waiting for this Farez Ziam knockout to happen for a really long time, and if it happens this weekend – He's going to be on your optimal lineup. And then another one, 
I think Kiesa is going to be a super popular underdog play this weekend. So give me Sean Brady to come out here, submit this guy, and also be on the optimal lineup. All right. I like it. Yeah. Uh, and I can see both of those. I was thinking about going with uh, Z and myself if you did not. But instead, I will go with – let's go with – I'm going to go with uh, the guy that I can't even pronounce his name, uh, Aorchi Lang, something like that. Aori here, the Mongolian murderer, as you would call him. That's who I will pick as my kill shot this week. I think he could get a knockout in any round, score well that way. But – just to pay off his DraftKings salary, I think any win could do that this week. So he's going to be my pick. Um, hopefully they all come through. We win some money this week. Good luck to you, Dan. Good luck to everybody listening this week. Hopefully we'll see some DFS Army helmets at the top of the leaderboards. Uh, until next time, we are out. Peace.